tonight. Guiding the rage in St. Louis. You kill our kids, we will kill your economy. Inside Trump's voter fraud panel. And food fight in the EU. Six young undocumented immigrants are suing the Trump administration over its plans to end a policy that allows them to live and work in the U.S. The suit is the first to be brought by recipients of DACA. They claim the president's decision violates their due process rights and was motivated by unconstitutional bias against Mexicans and Latinos. At a DACA press conference in San Francisco today, House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi was interrupted by protesters demanding protections for undocumented young people. The parents of a Georgia Tech student who was killed over the weekend by a campus police officer are questioning why the officer used lethal force. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation said police were responding to a call about an armed person. In a cell phone video, two officers can be heard asking Scout Schultz to drop a knife. And Schultz says, quote, shoot me. Why did you have to shoot? That's the question. Today, Iraq's Supreme Court temporarily halted a referendum on Kurdish independence planned for next Monday. The court said that judges need to review multiple claims that the referendum is unconstitutional before a vote can take place. But a Kurdish official said the vote would go on as planned, regardless of the court's new ruling. Israel is the only country that has voiced support for the referendum. The lawyers for Pepe the Frog's creator, Matt Fury, have served cease and desist orders to several alt-right personalities and websites, including Richard Spencer's altright.com. Fury originally created Pepe as a non-political character, but it was appropriated by internet bigots, many of them Trump supporters. Fury's lawyers have also sent takedown requests to sites like Reddit, informing them that the alt-right's use of Pepe on their platforms is copyright infringement. This is not about making America great again. Right. America's never been great. It's always been racist. It was built on slave labor. Reverend Clinton Stansel, the pastor of Wayman AME Church, prepared for this moment for weeks. We are not surprised, but saddened. Uh, for people of color, there seems to be no justice in America. No justice! We're tired, we're frustrated. Again, we're not surprised. It's the verdict we expected, since it's the verdict that we always get. The acquittal in St. Louis last Friday of Jason Stockley, the former police officer who killed Anthony Lamar Smith after a high-speed chase in 2011, has led to widespread protests in the city every day since. There's been occasional clashes between protesters and police, and at least 100 people have been arrested so far. In the days leading up to the verdict, Stansel called for a protest movement to shut down the streets of St. Louis and disrupt the economy of the city, but without violence and destruction. We will kill your economy! Who shut it down? You got to strike a tough balance because you've got to find a way to encourage people to stay peaceful without distancing yes. okay. yourself from them. Right. right. That's that's a tough balance. And and I, but but then you have to understand our role. Our role as clergy and as leaders to stay between the protesters and the police officers to make sure there is peace. The clergy is trying to avoid the mistakes they made three years ago, when violent protests engulfed the suburb of Ferguson for weeks after Officer Darren Wilson avoided indictment for killing Michael Brown. They were late to arrive on the scene and slowed to form relationships with the protesters. When they called for peace and calm, they were branded as old and out of touch. This time, Stancil was determined to support the protesters' outrage, while still urging them in the direction of nonviolence. Our role this time was to lead and guide and try to show the young protesters a better way of doing it. Before the verdict came down, you said a couple things like, if 
he's not found guilty, the blood will be on your hands. This, this you were concerned about violence. My position was that some of the responsibility of Anthony Lamar Smith dying is on Judge Wilson's hand. There is no justice when cops can kill without retribution. They're gonna do it again. But also, because you took three weeks to render a verdict, you put people in a pressure cooker. Tonight, I think the same thing you saw downtown. I think we're gonna have a peaceful protest. This is one of the richest areas in St. Louis. And so we wanna cause mass disruption in this economic power base, because our message is simple. You kill our kids, we will kill your economy. If you kill our kids, we will kill our Stancil and the other clergy left around 9 o'clock, but the protests continued. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Eventually, they arrived at the mayor's front door. Next morning, religious and community leaders gathered at Stancil's church to talk about what to do next. I got a call uh, you know, in, in the night of, of what was going on and what was happening. Um, Were you disappointed? No, not at all. How can I be disappointed when we, when these young people put together a protest that was 98% peaceful? And so to stop protesting or to not protest because the acts of a few, that's something that we, we just, I think the risk is worth it. I mean, you know, last night was pretty violent, though. Police were hurt and there was tear yes. gas going through the streets. But that happens every night in our community. It turns violent. Nobody seems to care then. Nobody covers that. So we, do we apologize that it turned violent in the so-called good neighborhood? Well, we don't want it to turn violent. We pray that it never does again, but welcome to our world. Friday's acquittal of Jason Stockley was the latest in a series of high-profile cases in which a police officer was found not guilty for killing a civilian. <laughs> Nearly 2,700 people have been shot and killed by police since 2015. Stockley was one of 35 officers charged with murder or manslaughter during that time, according to Philip Stinson an ex-cop who has assembled the country's best database of crimes committed by police officers and the charges filed against them. These charges represent a major improvement in the attempt to hold police officers accountable. Since 2005, 83 non-federal police officers have been charged with murder or manslaughter for their actions on the job, nearly half since 2015. The spike followed Michael Brown's shooting in Ferguson, Missouri in August 2014, and the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, which grew out of the wide distribution of shocking videos on social networks. These videos and pressure from activists placed more scrutiny on departments, many of which responded by equipping officers with body cams and dashboard cameras. The footage changed public perception and pushed prosecutors to bring more cops to court. Dash cam, body cam, citizen videographers, this type of technology is changing so fast. 
If we look at the officers who were charged in 2015 and 2016, at least 18 of their cases involve some sort of video evidence. So I think that's one difference we are seeing is that when an officer is charged, there are several things that might lead to that, including the existence of video. And, and the video changes the dynamics of these cases in a number of ways. So in the past, the police have always owned the narratives, and that's because a dead man can't talk. But now we've got another side to the story quite often, and that seems to draw a lot more attention to these cases. But while video evidence may make it more likely for cops to be charged, it's far from a guarantee that they'll be convicted. Even as the number of cases against cops has risen, the number of convictions really hasn't. Okay. Okay. Don't reach for it, then. Don't pull it out. Don't pull it out. Take the case of Philando Castile, whose death was live streamed to the world on Facebook. Stay with me. We got pulled over for a busted tail light in the back. Dash cam footage of Castile's shooting was shown at trial. Yet the officer in that case was acquitted last July. To carry. He was trying to get out his ID. I still have to figure out if you have a life. And juries in Milwaukee and Cincinnati recently failed to convict cops who had killed civilians, despite video evidence in both cases. This recurring result may come down to a common attitude towards law enforcement. Even while calling for accountability, people are just more likely to give cops the benefit of the doubt. Many jurors are not going to second guess the split second life or death decisions of an on duty police officer in a potentially violent street encounter where the officer uses deadly force. They're just, just not going to do it. We're in a rigged system, folks. In voter fraud. Voter fraud is all too common. Well, if they're going to vote for me, we'll think about it, right? Dear Mr. Dunlap, I'm writing to ask you to resign from Trump's sham election commission. I'm a Democrat, and I urge you to not be a part of it. Postmark Seattle, so. Got a lot from Brooklyn, too, by the way. <sighs> Wyoming. You have no need of being on the president's sham commission, okay? Matt Dunlap is the Secretary of State in Maine. He's one of five Democrats on the 12-person Presidential Advisory Commission on Election Integrity. And he gets a lot of mail. This is one of my personal favorites. Um, I urge you to resign from the Presidential Advisory Commission on Election Integrity. To help you make that decision, I am sending you dictionary definitions of the word integrity. <laughs> helpful. Very helpful. The so-called Voter Fraud Commission was created in response to President Trump's claim that millions of people voted illegally in last year's election. Did you have any reservations about joining the commission? When the president says something like, he would have won the popular vote if three to five million votes, possibly illegal votes, hadn't been cast. You know, that's not true. I know that's not true. And, but, you know, the point of being able to, to pull away the covers from, you know, you look under the bed and see there's no monster there, I think that's a pretty valuable thing to be able to do. But a lot of Democrats disagree. They think Dunlap's presence on the commission legitimizes it and that he should resign. You know, the people that want to dismantle the commission or demand that we all resign from it. Um, sham voter fraud commission is what people usually call it. You know, the, you do that. And then the other side will say, well, the reason why they want to dismantle that because they don't want anybody to know about the busloads of illegal immigrants they bring into the polling places every year. And the legend goes on. I think you squash it here by answering the questions. Let all vote! Let all vote! There have been a lot of questions about what exactly this commission plans to do. The group has asked every state to hand over its voter rolls, but hasn't said what that data will be used for. And the commission has only met twice, including a much anticipated public meeting last week in New Hampshire. It was led by the commission's vice chair, Chris Kobach, who is also the secretary of state in Kansas and the author of some of the strictest voter ID and registration laws in the country. The meeting featured testimony on voter turnout, fraud, and cybersecurity. There was even a demonstration of voting machines from 1892. The ballot goes in the box, and the duct tape helps it, helps it go in. <laughs> <laughs> but 
but the meeting was overshadowed by Kobach defending a claim he made in a Breitbart op-ed just days before, that he knows thousands of people voted illegally in New Hampshire last year because they did not have an in-state driver's license. Because unlike my state of Kansas, which doesn't have people flooding across the border to participate in primaries, to possibly cast a vote, in New Hampshire, it's a swing state. Everybody comes here. Voter fraud is Kobach's obsession. In Kansas, Kobach prosecutes voter fraud and has won nine convictions, most of them against people who voted in more than one state. But his claims about New Hampshire are patently false. Using an out-of-state license to register to vote is both legal and common in the state, especially for college students. Making this equation that somehow people not updating their driver's license is an indicator of voter fraud would be almost as absurd as saying that if you have cash in your wallet, that that's proof that you robbed a bank. After the meeting had ended, Kobach didn't seem phased by criticism from his fellow commissioners. In fact, he doubled down on the issue of rampant voter fraud by citing a figure from the Heritage Foundation. The conservative think tank found almost 1,100 instances of voter fraud in local, state, and federal elections since 1948. That's an incredibly small number when you consider that more than 3 billion votes have been cast in federal elections alone over that same period. But Kobach argues these 1,100 instances show just how big the problem could be. Now we're trying to just get a glimpse of the iceberg. How big is it? How much? How many cases are there that we did that weren't convicted? So I know. You think 1,100 could go to three to five million? I don't know, but here's. But I do know that the the, the tip of the iceberg is a very small percentage. We're, we'll probably never have a a complete picture of the problem, but the more facts we can get, the the better specificity and accuracy we'll have in de in describing how big that iceberg is below the water. As for Matt Dunlap, he doesn't think there's an iceberg. And he doesn't think the commission will find any evidence of widespread voter fraud. The 1,100 cases that they've caught, I mean, that's done, right? And, um, but in the, against the backdrop of the claim of the president that three to five million people voted illegally, well, they got 4,999,000 to go to, to match that number. Um, and I think the reality is the number is very, very minuscule. In Europe, a massive food fight is coming to a head. Governments in the EU's Eastern Bloc claim that brands like Coca-Cola and Nutella are selling them second-rate versions of the same products available in richer Western countries. They want a new law requiring parity of ingredients and products across Europe. Slovakian have not weniger fish and fish chips verdient. In the meantime, customers are taking matters into their own shopping carts. Pavel Dax lives a five-minute walk from his nearest supermarket. But every two weeks, he hands out passports to his children and drives 40 kilometers across the border to Austria to buy groceries. Why do you come here? Here? Yeah. Because good quality. Good quality? Yes. You think that in Austria, they produce better quality food than they do in Slovakia, is that right? Yes because Austrians don't buy non-quality food. Really? You can see everything is very good, very nice. Eastern Europe is getting richer. With growing awareness and anger about apparent differences in food quality, more and more supermarket migrants like Pavel are taking advantage of Europe's open borders. Every year you can see here more and more people from Slovakia. Yes, you can see Bratislava, Dunajska Streda, this is from uh, Czech Republic. The governments of Hungary, Slovakia, Czechia and Bulgaria have all carried out lab tests comparing products sold in their countries with those sold to Western neighbours. Slovakia tested 22 products against Austrian equivalents and found differences in 13 of them. Iglo fish fingers in Slovakia, for example, contain just 53% cod compared to 62% in Austria. Though, Iglo has said it has fish finger products with lower cod in some Western countries too. They found Slovak Coca-Cola was less sweet and made entirely with glucose syrup, 
compared to the sugar-based recipe in Austria. Cheeses, cookies, and local tea bags were all found to have significant differences. And while Hungary didn't find any scientific differences in its Nutella, it says the version it gets is less creamy. And that's one of the many discrepancies with East-West products. Attila Nagy oversaw the Hungarian tests. Tell me how products that are sold by big brands in Western Europe differ from those sold in Eastern Europe. If a termiket egy átlag vásárló megnézi, akkor a főkép, a, a jelölés látóképe az hasonló volt, a termék hasonlóan nézett ki, de az összetéti jellemzőkben feltüntették azokat a különbségeket, amelyek a két terméket jellemezték. Ezeket a különbségeket általában meg is találtuk a laboratóriumi vizsgálattal. The so-called dual food scandal hits a raw nerve in a region which has, since Soviet times, cast an envious eye at the lifestyles of its Western neighbours. Joining the EU after the collapse of the Soviet Union was sold to them as a way of levelling the playing field. Big brands told us that where there is a significant difference in product ingredients, it isn't because of discrimination. They blame production costs, including higher sales taxes in the East, and the availability of ingredients differing between regions. Lubomir Tusha represents many of them in Slovakia, including Coca-Cola. Why are some branded products different in terms of their taste and their makeup in Slovakia than they are in Austria? Once uh, may you know uh, the consum consumer is uh, uh, very uh, sensitive, sensitive for price, you do your best uh, to uh, uh, make such product uh, that uh, can uh, fulfill expectation of the consumer. It's not uh, the difference in quality, but uh, there is a difference in composition uh, and the outcome is also the price. Mm -hmm. But there's absolutely nothing in the branding to suggest that you're getting a product which has a different composition. But uh, the labeling uh, uh, states uh, composition, uh, so uh, you see uh, what you get. For now, Eastern European governments are maintaining their pressure on the brands and on Brussels. The Slovak government told us if the EU doesn't act, it will set up a website to name and shame brands that use dual ingredients so customers can boycott them. In response, the EU has announced it will spend a million dollars to help food regulators detect poorer quality goods across borders by the end of this year. My name is Darren Aronofsky. I'm the writer and director of Mother. I identify with every character in every film, you know. I, I made a film about a ballerina, and I was the ballerina. I made a film about the wrestler, and I was the wrestler. I was the conquistador, I was the math whiz. You pull on things you know, things that mean something to you, and you try to put those feelings and emotions into the character to bring them to life. I had an idea, and I was thinking about the home invasion genre as a really kind of interesting place to start. Everyone can relate to having company over that doesn't, you know, doesn't agree to leave. At the same time, that you know, I was having a lot of frustration about the inaction of people sort of dealing with our larger home, not just our individual home, but this planet we're on together. And I decided to sort of think about the planet as a character. Uh, myself, Jennifer Lawrence, and Javier Bardem went to a warehouse out, out in East Brooklyn, and we taped the house out onto the floor there, and we just started to talk and go through the script. And the last two weeks of that three-month period, we shot the entire film, like, with single takes, without any costumes or anything, and then cut it together and had sort of a two-hour-long version of the movie so that we could sort of see what was working and what wasn't working. What I like in movies is to be rocked, you know? This is very much, it's for people who want to go on that extreme ride. And uh, someone at Paramount was like, no, no, it, this isn't a ride in the park. It's, it, it was built outside the park by that really weird guy. <laughs> and he's daring you to come on it. And you only really ride it if you take your hands off the handlebar the whole time. Anytime you blink or close your eyes, you haven't had the full impact of the film. The last third of the film is something we call the fever dream. 
and the film kind of goes from zero to 60 uh, faster than a Tesla. My mentor always said you either got to make them laugh, cry, or scare the shit out of them. I mean, it's, this is a movie, you know? We're competing with uh, so many things. When you make movies, it's just like, you know, people are watching TV right now, you know, with their phones out or their computers and double, triple screening at the same time. I wanted to make something that was just, you know, punk rock in your face, filling your ears, uh, feeling your, filling your head with ideas, filling your heart with emotion and, uh, you know, hopefully we drop a few jaws along the way. That's Vice News Tonight for Monday, September 18th. 